Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Learning Analytics, Where to Start. Thank you for attending. My name is Joanna Williams, and I am the Marketing Assistant at Unicon. I will be facilitating today's webinar, which features a walkthrough of Unicon's new LA Quick Start service by Linda Fang and Gary Gilbert. Linda Fang is a software architect at Unicon. She has deep experience in student information systems integration, open standards, big data, and learning analytics. Linda most recently served as Senior Product Manager for Canvas SIS Integrations and Canvas Data at Instructure. She will be joined by Gary Gilbert, a software architect at Unicon, who provides technical leadership for our integrations and learning analytics practice. Gary has been involved in open standards efforts, including IMS LTI. Over the last few years, Gary has served as the technical lead for the Aperio Learning and Analytics Initiative. Our speakers welcome your questions throughout the presentation. Since you will be placed on mute during this webinar, we encourage you to use the Q&A capability to submit your questions. You can access the Q&A by clicking on the Q&A icon located in the black bar menu at the top of your screen. We are recording today's webinar. You will receive an email with a link to view the recording and to download the slides. You will also be able to view the recording on Unicon's YouTube channel. And now, let's proceed with our presentation. I'll turn it over to Linda, who will begin with a brief introduction to Unicon and our learning analytics services. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to say it's it's really great to uh, to now be with Unicon, uh, where in a lot of ways I'm able to continue the same conversations I've been having with schools and universities over the years, uh, specifically around surfacing data from their LMS. Can you guys hear me okay? Um, Okay, great. And I, I encourage you to, I hope this can be very interactive, and I encourage you to yeah, use that Q&A uh, button, I guess, that's, that's on your bar, um, Zoom bar there, uh, for, uh, for submitting any comments or questions as we go along. So our goal today is really, at first, we're, we're trying to share some of the challenges that we've been hearing specifically around learning analytics um, and you know interestingly enough unicon being a consulting company not a product company um, we're usually the ones that are kind of looking for a solution or a group of solutions that is uh, you know uh, tailored to fit what our customers are needing um, and as we've been working with customers what we've noticed uh, in some of the conversations is that uh, you know, while there's interest in analytics and general consensus around the value of analytics, there seems to still be a lot of uh, uh, challenges that schools are facing around getting started. Just, just kind of the, the how do we get going in the first place? How do we show early success? Um, it seems uh, in general to appear to be a daunting prospect that, you know, uh, you know involves kind of multi-year, uh, you know, high resource type um, activities. And once we've talked a little bit about those challenges, Gary's actually going to take us through an approach that we've come up with based on some work that we've done uh, with some of our clients. And then finally, I'm going to talk about our new quick start service, which is just one possible way to get started. It's something we think that um, will help given kind of our current climate today. And then we're happy to take questions um, uh, and, and hopefully have a good conversation at that point. So a little bit about Unicon. We're an education technology consulting service company. Uh, we provide services, strategy, and support uh, focused on education. We have a deep domain-specific uh, expertise. The people who work at Unicon live and breathe education. Uh, and we are uh, actively involved in several open source software projects um, and the foundations that support them. Um, uh, client base is over 250 colleges and universities, several large publishers, and then dozens of ed tech companies um, uh, as well in, in that space. And we've been around for a while, coming up now on 24 years in business, uh, headquartered in the Phoenix area of Arizona. Lots of different domain 
uh, areas that Unicon works in, uh, from learning technology around assessments um, and content delivery to integrations, identity and access management, and cloud services. Um, the topic that we're going to be talking about today and focusing on today is around student success learning analytics. And you may have heard of Unicon in the context of open source and open standards. We, Unicon believes in using open standards for software wherever possible. Examples of communities where we have involvement are the Aperio Foundation, which houses the CAS and UPortal communities, and IMS Global Consortium, which defines the interoperability standards like LTI, LIS1 roster, and Caliper Analytics. So for the last several years now, Unicon's offered a wide variety of services in the learning analytics space, uh, from readiness assessment, and roadmap planning, to implementation, scalability, and performance testing. We've been one of the key implementation partners for several large analytics projects, creating most, if not all, of the technology and infrastructure uh, for the Aperio Open Analytics Initiative, uh, that'll, that Gary will be touching on uh, some of the various components um, in just a little bit. And we've also been directly involved in the IMS Caliper uh, Analytics Workgroup effort for the last several years. And in delivering all of those projects in all of those areas, what we found is that schools often face those challenges of getting started with their analytics implementation. And a lot of it revolves around uh, different groups on campus having oftentimes different ideas, uh, not necessarily having common uh, terminology to begin with, um, feeling like, again, the projects are uh, hard to get started, um, uh, seeming like there's a, a huge undertaking that's involved just to kind of get something going. And while there's general consensus that using that data is valuable, the issues that invariably arise are, you know, what's the relevant data? Uh, how do you correlate the streams of different information? And how do you correlate that even with actual learning? What data is the right data? Where's the data coming from? Who owns it on campus? All of these questions uh, typically do arise and are, um, uh, you know, again, part of the, the larger challenge that I think schools are facing. So in helping schools to come to terms with all of that, one way that we've found that works well is to start with a conversation. And this can be really effective in establishing the goals and aligning all the stakeholders, uh, you know, just having conversations where questions that get talked about are things like, you know, when you think of learning analytics, what do you mean? Why would you want it on campus? What roles or departments should be involved in that conversation? And also getting schools to think about, you know, what would you do about data that you have uh, when, when you can, if you can track students that, and what they're doing during their time at your institution? And those kind of conversations can, can all be done without a vendor. But uh, sometimes if you need help, a, a third party can be a good way to facilitate that kind of collaboration across the groups. So for us, this is how we like to approach our integration and analytic services. The idea is to build a foundation using open source components and work with the customer to find the right analytics priorities, if you will, for uh, for the customer's needs. And on the technology side, the most common need is around establishing services to do data collection, storage, and analysis. So I'm going to hand it over to Gary now, who's going to describe an analytics infrastructure that we've arrived at based on work we did with one of our clients. All right. Thank you, Linda. And, uh, and thanks to everybody for joining us today. Uh, I'm Gary Gilbert. I've, I've been with Unicon for about 14 years now. Uh, and for the majority of that time, I've been involved uh, in the integrations and analytics work we've been doing here at Unicon. Um, and so before we get uh, started with talking about uh, uh, one possible approach to an open analytics infrastructure, uh, I'd like to talk about one of our, uh, one of our projects, uh, the, the GIST project. Uh, so 
JISC Learning Analytics um, it is a project we've been involved with uh, since its inception uh, a year and a half ago or so. And if you're not familiar with the JISC, um, they're a nonprofit uh, in the United Kingdom, and they have a very, uh, very simple charter, uh, improve higher education uh, across the United Kingdom. So a very broad, uh, but very specific charter. And the JISC uh, is they're working on a national scale uh, learning analytics and data warehousing project, uh, of which Unicon has been involved with since the beginning, uh, both providing uh, support to institutions to get them onboarded into the project. So basically working with institutions to determine whether they're ready uh, to embark on a, a learning analytics project and also responsible for a variety of the technical components that make up uh, the learning analytics architecture that they're using. Uh, and so I, I mentioned the gist because this project has really helped us to um, formalize our ideas around learning analytics and come up with some of the uh, approaches that we're going to talk about today. And I want to show you the JISC architecture quickly uh, because really you can think about this as the, the reference architecture uh, for, uh, for learning analytics today. Uh, and, and the key piece uh, is that piece in the middle, uh, the learning records warehouse, where we have a number of systems, they're all spread out along the bottom there, things like learning management systems, student information systems, all feeding into a centralized learning records warehouse. And then that records warehouse provides data to downstream systems to do you know, any number of things, but typically dashboards, potentially doing predictive analytics, potentially doing uh, running intervention uh, and case management tools. But the key to the architecture, and what, what I'll be talking about mostly today, is that centralized learning records warehouse. And so out of the GIST project and, and other projects that we've done, um, we've come up with uh, some goals for what we call an open learning analytics infrastructure. So any learning analytics infrastructure should support the collection and storage of a variety of data. So you should be able to take in data from a variety of sources in a variety of formats. And then the infrastructure has to be able to make that data available for any number of downstream uses, whether it's for analytics, whether it's for, for reporting or for visualization. And so I, I think you could say that, you know, those two goals are, are pretty common across any analytics infrastructure. What makes an open analytics infrastructure is the use of open standards for interoperability. So where it's appropriate using standards like IMS Caliper, Experience API, IMS One Roster to achieve interoperability between system components. And then also using open software open predictive models and open processes where those are appropriate as well. And so if you take those goals and you apply them to a conceptual architecture, you end up with a picture like this one here, where you have a variety of data sources, you have a, some data collection and data storage, and then you have some data, data usage. And typically what we see is we have software applications on the data sources side, Sometimes those software applications have the ability to emit data in real time that can be collected. But often we have to talk to something like an operational data store to pull data that we need. Or even in some cases, we have to work with uh, file exports from a particular system. That data gets aggregated and collected and, and the storage mechanism will depend on what you're trying to do. But, but you know, oftentimes you'll see that data being stored on something like HDFS, the Hadoop file system, or potentially on an object store like Amazon S3, or if you have more structured data, uh, potentially in a database. And then that data will be, a, will be made available to downstream systems via APIs. And the typical usage that we see is for business intelligence and visualization. Uh, the, the majority of use that we still see today is, is for reporting purposes. And then we do have some uh, institutions that are taking advantage of data for things like predictive analytics and just making that data available to uh, their staff to do things like ad hoc query. 
And so if we apply um, the open analytics to that same conceptual view, we typically get an environment that looks like this. We have data sources, and those data sources are typically a learning management system. And in a lot of cases, but not all the cases, uh, the learning management system has the ability to broadcast event information in real time. Um, we typically will integrate with a student information system to get all of the supporting data, so things like classes and users and enrollments and assignments and things like that. Um, and then in the data storage area, we have a system that it's known by a number of different names. Some, sometimes you hear it as a learning record store. Uh, we like to refer to it as a learning record warehouse. So that's the application that has the ability to take in that data and then store it. And then downstream on, on the usage side, we have things like dashboards that provide visualizations of that data and also potentially um, something like Hadoop to do ETL or predictive analytics. And then down at the bottom, you see that those different tiers are connected by you know, APIs where appropriate and where possible, but oftentimes uh, other processes. And we call those other processes data loaders. So if you don't have the ability to get data moving between the systems via APIs, often you'll have to build something, whether it's a custom software application or some kind of custom process to move data between systems, and we call that a data loader. And so with that open analytics conceptual infrastructure, we've taken those lessons learned and, and that concept and uh, applied it to the work that we've been doing with the Aperio uh, Open Software Foundation uh, in their learning analytics initiative. And so we have uh, three applications uh, within that infrastructure that support a lot of the same things that you saw in, in those goals and those concepts. And we have the open learning record warehouse that can be used to capture event data in real time using standards like XAPI and Caliber, as well as all of the data that you need to support that event information, so things like users and classes. Open Dashboard is a visualization tool, and then the student success plan uh, can be used for intervention uh, and case management. And so if we take that diagram again and apply the Aperio components to it, you see that the Aperio Learning Records Warehouse fits as the data storage and collection piece. The Aperio Dashboard is our visualization tool. And we're integrating using standards like XAPI and Caliper, IMS One Roster. And, and often, we still need to build things like custom data loaders to take data from one system to another. So just to dive a little bit deeper into some of those components, um, the, the open learning records warehouse, if, if you've been following the space, uh, and especially if you've been following the work that we've been doing as part of Aperio, you may be familiar with uh, open LRS, so open learning records store. Uh, but what we found is that an, an LRS or a traditional LRS that only holds event data, it just wasn't sufficient for the, the kinds of downstream tasks that we needed to perform. We really needed to be able to have that event data alongside all of the supporting information to be able to really do things like predictive analytics, visualizations, and other uses that we wanted to be able to do with the data. So you can think of the OpenLRW project as a standards-based learning record warehouse, and it leverages a lot of the, the main standards we've already talked about, IMS Caliper and XAPI for event information, an IMS One roster uh, for all of that supporting data. And then uh, the Open Dashboard project, which is what we use for our visualizations, it's, it's, it's really an LTI tool um, that originally kind of started out as, as a framework for any kind of visualization. But today, it's moving toward more of a faculty and staff-centric tool. And Linda will show you some, some of the visualizations that we've uh, developed for it. And then finally, some of the data loaders. So I mentioned data loaders are those custom processes or custom applications that, that you may need in the cases where you can't uh, necessarily leverage an API to move data between systems. And 
So we've been working on a couple of those. Um, one is for Canvas that we'll talk about. We're also working on one for Moodle. Uh, but the key to these is that they'll be available uh, to be able to pull data uh, from a variety of different systems, turn it into the right data that the LRW expects, and allow you to position this as a way to move data on some kind of scheduled basis from uh, data sources into that open learning record warehouse. And here's, a, here's an example of uh, the Canvas data loader. So uh, Instructure offers a service called Canvas data, and that's what you see up at the top here. At some interval, uh, they're doing data exports uh, from the Canvas LMS, and those get put on to Amazon S3. And that's where the Canvas data loader comes in. So at some scheduled interval, whether it's nightly, whether it's weekly, uh, whatever you, you know, whatever you want to, whatever interval you want to schedule it at, the data loader will go and pull uh, those uh, Canvas data extracts, pull those down, uh, transform them all uh, into the appropriate caliper or IMS1 roster format, and deliver those via an API uh, to the LRW. So a lot of interesting things are happening there. So number one, you know, the Canvas data loader uh, knows how to communicate with uh, with Canvas data to get that, uh, get the extracts. And number two, we've, we've developed a set of mappings to be able to take the various uh, Canvas data uh, facts and dimensions and map them appropriately to, you know, the various IMS1 roster entities, so things like users and classes and enrollments, and also to the various caliper event types. And so there's some there's some interesting things there, uh, but this is really the process that allows us to take that data in the, the format that we get from Canvas data and turn it into a standards-based format that the Aperio uh, Open LRW expects. And finally, the last thing I'll touch on is uh, the Aperio-centric realization of the open analytics infrastructure is certainly possible to deploy that on AWS uh, as it is, but we know that we have customers that uh, don't necessarily want to have to uh, manage things like a MongoDB replica set or manage their own uh, learning records warehouse. So one of the things we're working on is uh, the same kind of approach, the same kind of open analytics infrastructure, but taking a more AWS-centric approach where we're leveraging AWS managed services to pr pr provide the same set of features that the Aperio components are, but you get to leverage the scalability and ease of use uh, of the various uh, Amazon components instead of managing your own environments. And that, with that, I'll turn it back over to Linda. Great, thanks Gary. So again, we encourage you to, to submit any questions or, or comments that you might have as we go through this. Um, so, so based on, again, what we've talked about with all of the challenges and the latest, latest thinking that Gary just talked about with how, that, how the tech is coming together, uh, we'd like to offer a way to get started. So, Again, thinking about, uh, again, the, the stuff that Gary just presented, one approach uh, for getting started is really just plugging your LMS into the open LRW and seeing what kind of visualizations you might create. And that's the main goal of the LA Quick Start service that we've just announced. So it includes the open components that we've mentioned, uh, open LRW and open LRS, or, sorry, open LRS uh, is the former name of open LRW and open dashboard. Uh, and integration with Canvas data is also included there, plus uh, 40 hours of consulting hours that can be used towards things like readiness or roadmap planning. And the goal here is to help lay that foundation and get conversations going um, using data that's in, in your institution already. And once you're able to feed all that Canvas data activity into the LRW, there's lots of different possibilities for how to show the data uh, in visual ways. 
So one way that we came up with was something that uh, we've been calling the student pulse, uh, which I'm going to show you here in a sec. Um, and the idea is to show a series of bubbles um, representing, you know, sort of along the timeline of a course, one row for each student, the, where the size of the bubble represents a composite activity level for, uh, for the student on that day. So let's take a look at that. And I will hopefully be able to, here we go. Can you guys see that? Um, so this is an, an, an example of the uh, activity pulse, and again, this one is uh, sort of something in our test environment um, where, for example, uh, uh, along the timeline of the course, um, you can kind of see sort of the bigger bubbles and the, and the smaller bubbles representing uh, different levels of activity for, for a, a given student on a given day. And you can kind of zoom in and out. Um, just to kind of look a little bit closer, you can maybe go sort of forward and backwards on this timeline. Um, and, uh, and that's sort of, again, how uh, you might want to, as, as an instructor, take a closer look at who, who's doing what in your class as far as engagement with the course content that you have online. Um, and then what we also did was we said, well, uh, you know, if we already know within the course what assignments are, are sort of being uh, uh, presented and, and when their due dates are, um, we could overlay those on the same timeline. So this gives you some idea of, you know, perhaps kind of leading up to an assignment, um, trying to determine whether or not, uh, you know, you have students that are more active or less active kind of before or after an assignment or, or a quiz. And then what we have also is just to, here's another view um, where we've got the same uh, student pulse visualization that's now hooked into our Unicon Canvas sandbox. So within, uh, this is sort of hooked in using LTI uh, to an existing uh, course that's created here in our sandbox. And again, uh, same, same idea of being able to look at some of this data, um, being able to sort uh, on activity, um, and then here you can drill into uh, uh, sort of a closer view of the kind of activity uh, that, that's represented through the Canvas data. So again, uh, we're trying to think of what are the useful things that might be shown using the data that you can get out of Canvas. Um, so here we're experimenting with these things so we can show things like activity uh, over time, uh, we can show activity by type, um, we can, you know, maybe take a look at time of day by day of week. Again, these are just examples of uh, ways that you might want to display, uh, you know, again, just the, the basic um, uh, event data that's coming from Canvas and, and coming in that stream that, that Gary talked about. And again, you can kind of see the breakdown. Um, so essentially, uh, different types of activity, you know, get sorted, and you can kind of keep track of whether or not, you know, there's there's submissions um, versus uh, discussion posts and so on. And again, this is uh, something that we're uh, we're excited to, you know, be working with Canvas just to uh, uh, kind of get more uh, richer uh, ways to to um, uh, bucketize, I guess, if you will, some of this data and, uh, and make it available uh, in a visual way. All right, so now let me go kind of back. Uh, one of the other things too I was just gonna say is um, that if you imagine uh, you know, where you have uh, students and you, wanna, might, you might wanna investigate you know, uh, students that have sort of dropped off for whatever reason, um, it would be very easy for us also to add in uh, messaging here. So you could uh, simply, you know, uh, choose to, to send messages um, through the Canvas API as well um, that, uh, you know, are based on uh, the visual um, interactions that you have with this type of dashboard. Okay. So now if jumping straight into the tech isn't the way that uh, you want to get started, um, we also offer a readiness assessment service. And this is that facilitated conversation that we help you with. And we've actually done this uh, over a dozen times with institutions as part of the JISC project that Gary talked about. Uh, and we're actually in the process of publishing our analysis of the trends that we've learned uh, from that work as well. So the readiness assessment process is designed to be collaborative. It's typically held on site over one or two days, where the first day 
uh, tends to focus on the strategic goal setting um, involving multiple stakeholders. Um, and then into day two, it transitions into more of a tactical uh, focus uh, around technical goals um, and identifying what obstacles uh, you might uh, need to need to uh, address at that point. Um, and then we actually put together a report at the end that includes our assessment uh, and roadmap recommendations um, with options that we might outline for next steps. And this is an example of a typical technical deployment. Uh, so might start with, again, deploying the various components, open dashboard, LRW, um, and then uh, uh, moving through, again, the Canvas data mapping um, and deploying uh, aspects of, um, of the data loader um, uh, together with the LRW, so making those events flow through into the LRW and then allowing those um, events to then be shown in the dashboard. And then the last part of that is also just looking at designing integrations with other supporting systems as well, whether they might be SISs um, or other systems that you might have. So what's next and really what's missing here? Uh, we've been thinking a lot about uh, what we want to do next with this, um, you know, integrations, as Gary mentioned, with, with other LMSs, um, looking at getting other kinds of data from the SIS um, beyond just the, the supporting information. Um, and then, of course, the, uh, the Amazon version, as Gary showed as well. Um, but we'd really love to hear from you about what you think is missing or what else um, we might be able to work on together as a community. So just to recap here, as we go into Q&A, um, launching an analytics effort to collect and use learning data on your campus can seem daunting and risky, but we think it's worthwhile because it can have an impact on student success. And we've shown you an architecture that we think is, is right, and has relatively minimal front-end investment. And this just gives you a way to get started, lays that foundation, uh, and gives you kind of that conversation starter across your campus. And we also think it'll give you choices on directions you wanna go based on your goals. So as we go into the Q&A, again, I'd really love to hear more about uh, your experiences, what's been your difficulties, uh, has there been difficulty in getting conversations starting on your campus? Um, is it more on the technical side or is it organizational? Um, have you tried laying out an infrastructure or using some of the open source components that we've talked about? And you know, what's been your experience? Um, I can actually see a couple questions are coming in, so that's great. Um, I'm actually gonna think, just uh, flip over to the slide here where um, these are, this is uh, uh, my contact information as well as Gary's. So feel free to, uh, to reach out to us uh, just to follow up. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll go to the questions. Um, so I think this is, let's see, I'm just gonna read them aloud here. Can you speak to how learning data and standards require a different approach when compared to business or marketing analytics? Why does it require a different technical infrastructure? So yeah, so that's a good question. Um, and uh, maybe um, I'll kind of give my take on it and then Gary, uh, if, if you have uh, anything you wanna add. So typically, um, you know, we actually, um, in mapping out sort of the stack of the type of activity that can be you know, captured uh, by students interacting with course content or even, you know, again, any users interacting with, uh, with online, you know, sites uh, that, that are performing learning. Um, there's kind of the lowest level, which is, you know, just simply the, the web stream, the kind of the click stream, if you will. Um, and there's some information you can get from that. And that would, I think, typically potentially be more like what uh, you might get through marketing analytics. Um, but where we're trying to go with, you know, really understanding um, how 
you know, something is, is uh, you know, whether there's a transition that involves a series of, uh, you know, actions um, that leads to some kind of activity, you know, someone taking a quiz, someone um, who's trying to learn and maybe um, playing a video and then replaying the same video, um, being confused about some part of the, the, you know, course content that they're presented with, you know, how do you figure out that the set of click streams really correlates with that kind of functional event. So there's sort of the business level event. And so when you uh, think of, of learning, um, the, the functional aspects of learning, I think that's uh, more domain specific and um, is kind of the reason why I think we do try to think of uh, tools that have to have to have that understanding um, are going to be better suited um, to solving or at least um, working with that type of data. And I'll, I, I can touch on the, uh, the technical infrastructure part of the question. So why does it require a different technical infrastructure? Uh, I don't think it necessarily the necessarily requires a different technical infrastructure. You know, you could certainly uh, have a variety of different architectures that could do some similar things to what we what we talked about here. You know, there's a, a number of different data warehouses that you could potentially leverage, a uh, number of visualization tools that you leverage. Fundamentally though, I think the key points are, you're gonna wanna be able to aggregate all of the data from the various systems and, and using things, open standards like IMS Caliper, One Roster, and XAPI is gonna help you do that. And so I, I think that's where this architecture uh, is really strong in that you know, most of our learning systems are gonna adopt these kind of standards for interoperability. And so you'll have a, a leg up out of the box uh, when you're going to integrate with you know, a variety of systems across your campus. Thanks, Gary. So then I'm gonna move to the next question. It's uh, uh, from Steven. Is there a way to look at data across all courses at once. Uh, so yeah, the, uh, the courses, uh, the course view that we have is uh, a roll up of all the students in that course. And um, we've been so far focused on kind of looking at data kind of by course um, or within the course, I should say. Um, but certainly with the, with the information that's getting collected in the LRW, uh, there is, uh, you know, all of that data does exist and it's present. Um, so it really would be a matter of um, creating either the visualization or, um, or, uh, or expanding on the existing visualization that we've already created. Uh, the next question is whether a, re a recording of the webinar will be sent. I, th I believe so, yes. Um, and I think Joanna will address that when we close out our webinar here today. Um, and then uh, the next question is, um, I have several applications that make up the learning environment and would this solution support tracking interactions from various products, i.e. Kaltura, PLE, Blackboard, and other solutions? Um, that's a great question and that is exactly sort of the aim of uh, what we're trying to accomplish with creating the foundation of, of this open learning record warehouse. Uh, so, you know, and, and the efforts uh, that we've, uh, I think many of us uh, in, in the education space have been involved in in trying to standardize um, the way in which uh, tools uh, such as Kaltura um, and, and again, any sort of external learning tool that gets launched from an LMS um, can, uh, can send or, or capture um, activity data and sort of move it to a central place or a place that you know at least is in the right format that um, that can be received uh, by in a standard way and so yes that is the whole goal there that um, uh, as the caliper uh, standard and and again I think we today are um, uh, it, you know looking at um, Im improved adoption uh, for caliper 1.1 which is coming out soon um, uh, this will allow for the tool community, so the, the communities that you know, create the products that uh, students will go out and be using um, that kind of fan out, let's say, from an LMS. Um, and all of that information um, can then be captured by, uh, by something like the OpenLRW, which um, allows for a nicer uh, sort of view, holistic view of uh, information, uh, activity information about a student and where they're going and what they're doing. 
Uh, okay, and then we have one last question. It's a follow-up to the first question. Do we have examples where we've pulled in data from other LTI systems via Caliper? So I'll, I'll take that. So we, we haven't done it in practice uh, simply because there's not a lot of, it's not implemented in a lot of places, uh, but, but, but we know it's important, uh, you know, the ability to kind of track uh, student events across a session, across multiple LTI tool launches, uh, and in the learning record warehouse, specifically in the Caliper specification, uh, we have support for like the notion of a federated session and those kind of things. So it's there. Uh, we haven't ran into a real world implementation of it yet, though. Yeah, they, and I'll just add that, uh, you know, as part of uh, some of the work that's been going on within the Caliper work group uh, over the last uh, year or so, uh, there's been a couple places where um, I've participated in uh, like a proof of concept where uh, data from a Kaltura tool was fed into, um, you know, a, 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 essentially a, a, an endpoint that could pull that information uh, and combine it with other um, other input sources um, to uh, sort of display um, kind of a multi-mode uh, dashboard view. Okay, one more question is coming in here. Uh, can you tell us more about the work you've been doing with JISC around focus and scale? So I, I can, I'll take that one first, Linda, if you want to. Okay, yes, go ahead. Uh, so, so yeah, we're, we're in uh, a number of pilots with JISC, uh, so we really haven't seen you know, massive amounts of, of data yet, uh, but we, we know it's coming, and I, I think um, the infrastructure that JISC has in place, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be able to, to handle it. They've, they've thought about that from the beginning. Uh, so you know, the, from a scale perspective, I think they're in a really good position. Uh, focus wise yeah I think it's it's really been on uh, two things so number one getting data into their learning record warehouse from institutions it's it's always a challenge uh, it's a, you know there's a number of different systems that have to feed data in uh, so getting that process down making sure institutions could just get their data to the learning record warehouse uh, was was kind of focus one because without the data there's nothing else to do. Um, once schools got past that challenge, the next thing was the predictive model, uh, and, and you know there's there's a lot of work to be done there still. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's it's one of those things where uh, there's always some some differences in the predictive model across each institution. So scaling that process of developing the predictive model on a per institution basis um, that's that's another focus that that we've seen there as well. Thanks, Gary. Um, and uh, Kim is just asking a follow-up. Uh, is just using a central LRS approach rather than each, each institution having one? Yes. Yeah. So they have one. Uh, it's a. It's a. They call it the learning record. Learning record warehouse. Uh, that is multi-tenant, uh, you know, hosted multi-tenant system. Okay. Great. All right. Um, any other questions? We really appreciate all of your interaction. Oh, one more here. Is Unicon helping with predictive models? So Unicon, uh, we are, uh, you know, through our partners at, at Marist College. Uh, we, we help there. I mean, our, our main focus, or at least my primary focus, is more on the data side of things, getting data there. Uh, but we are involved in the predictive model part as well. Great. All right. Thanks again. Um, I think uh, unless there aren't are any other questions, Joanna, do you want to help close us out? Well, on behalf of our speakers and myself, thank all of you for joining us today. We hope you now have a clear understanding on how to get started with learning analytics at your institution. Please feel free to contact us with any additional questions you might have. Contact information for our speakers is provided on the current slide shown on your screen. You can also visit our website, unicon.net, to learn more about LA Quick Start service. 
As a reminder, we will, be we will be providing you with a link to view the webinar recording and to download the slides within the next few days. Thanks again and have a great rest of your day.